All right, good evening and welcome to Living Spirit Ministries. We're here Wednesday, the 17th of August, and we're just so glad that you made it. And so if this is your first time coming, we just come in here, roll up our sleeves and get into the word. If this is you being a repeat attender, we thank you for coming back. If you're on tape delay, then uh, thank you for piping in. We thank you for uh, coming and rightly dividing the word of God. We just love on God here and we just try to get to know him just a little bit more uh, by being in and through and with his word that we might learn to trust him to ultimately believe in him so that we can walk in his word by with and through his spirit that blood transfusion that is our lord jesus christ equipping empowering and encouraging us and so without further ado we've got a lot of stuff we want to go over tonight this is the third part in the series of road to redemption Remember, the overarching theme for this year is sound investment strategy. And so God is investing his word into us. And as he invests his word into us, we shall prosper not only in that word, we shall walk in that word, we shall be encouraged by that word. And guess what? It doesn't just stop there. We go out and, and, and edify not only the body of Christ, but go out and spread that word, plant that seed of Christ to all of creation. And whoever shall believe shall be blessed, right? And so this is our, our mission here, learning to walk again one step at a time. And this time around, learning to walk in Christ. And so as you can see there, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. We're talking about maturation here, but never, never, never getting too far ahead of ourselves to not look back from whence we came from and help those along the way uh, that would dare to receive this great thing called the gospel, the gospel of grace. All right. Heavenly Father, we call to you tonight. And we thank you now for your grace. We know that we haven't, uh, we haven't earned it. We can't afford it. And we certainly don't deserve it. But Father God, your love is displayed upon that cross, that cross of Calvary, and that blood that was shed so long ago and has saved me and the rest of these folks that would dare to believe, Father God. Father, we, we look to the cross as our compass tonight, Father God, to guide, direct us, lead us, Father God, morally and spiritually, legally, all these things, Father God. We look to it to guide and direct us, Father God. We also look to it for encouragement and strength, Father, for we serve an awesome and mighty God. And Father God, your love is manifested on that cross. Your son, Jesus Christ, being God himself in the flesh, forsook all the shame, forsook all the pain, and took upon all of our sins and our death upon him, Father God. You did this to him for us that we might be delivered back to you. So, Father God, we glory in your holy name tonight. We Words cannot describe the, the exaltation and the excitement that we have all encapsulated within heart, mind, body, and soul. So we thank you now, Father. We thank you for being who you say you are and for doing what you say you will do. So, Father God, we ask that you bless us from the crown of our head until the sole of our feet, that we might have uncluttered minds tonight, Father God, that our hearts might long for you, our bodies might be restored, Father God, and that our souls might walk in you tonight, Father God. So we're thanking you now for equipping, empowering, encouraging us tonight. We thank you for our strength being in your grace, Father God, and your gentle mercies covering us, Father. And now, Father God, not only may we equip, empower, and encourage our fellow brother and sister in Christ, but we would have the boldness and a conviction to go out and to give this gospel out into a dark and depraved world, Father God. Let us be our light bearers according to your word, Father God, putting on the high beam so that just the one tonight, Father God, might hear, see, or receive something that would allow him or her a better informed and enabled decision upon Jesus Christ, trusting and believing in him uh, for eternal salvation. So, Father God, we rejoice now in advance. We pay it forward on credit and we call it faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Faith in the right object. And that's what we're, we're, we're constantly harping on here. Not faith in self, not faith in the world, but doing a U-turn and getting back to where we, where we came from. And that's our Heavenly Father. And so that's what we're all talking about here the, the last couple of weeks. And so, again, we welcome everybody. Uh, first time, 
uh, or, or repeat attenders here, right? No offenders, but attenders. And so as you see the changing of the slides there, you are God's investment. And that goes back to the umbrella theme for this year of sound investment strategy. And so God has invested a lot into us. He's breathed his essence into us. He's created us in his image. But somewhere along the way, look back at Genesis chapter three, uh, we fell and we fell hard. Uh, and we and we start moving away from that. Well, since the beginning of time and really even before that, God put into motion a plan. He put a plan into action uh, to bring us back onto him. Now, this is the great thing about God. His thoughts and our thoughts are not the same. His ways and our ways are not the same. And that's according to Isaiah 55. The thoughts and the ways are not the same. And so when you look at that, and then you fast forward to Romans 12, and he talks about, Paul tells us that, that you know, uh, do not be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mindset has to be not of the world, not of self, but selfless and taking on of what God has. And then you can understand what he's invested into you. So we've taken some time out this year in this theme to understand this whole purpose, right? And I challenged you to, to go through this thing called life on purpose because you serve an intentional God. You serve an intentional God that got you up this morning, not haphazardly as if it was an accident. But he says what he means, he means what he says. So when you start looking at this thing called the Bible from cover to cover, it has a task and a purpose. Uh, and that's to draw you back onto him. It's the roadmap, right? If the cross be your, your compass, Right. So all roads lead back to the cross. Right. And so your belief in God's manifested grace, Christ crucified. Right. Uh, if you believe in that onto eternal salvation, right, you use this as your roadmap and for guidance for the happy, the glad, the sad, the mad all the times. It's it's that good. And this is your instruction manual. This is your roadmap uh, back to him. So we, we've we've talked over time about the, the, the three stages of your salvation. Right. You have. Past salvation, which is your justification, fancy word for being made approved. And that's your faith in that right object. And that right object is Jesus Christ. Because your works, according to Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, just aren't going to get you there. According to Titus 3 and 5, just aren't going to get you there. According, right, um, to Romans 3 and according to Romans 6, we've sinned and we've fallen. But the gift of God is everlasting life. Not our works. Right. Because our works lead someplace, but they don't lead back to God. Matter of fact, they lead us away from it. So this investment strategy, if you understand it from the beginning, from Genesis one all the way to the end of the book of Revelations, you understand that, that his word has gone forth and has a mission. Right. And his word has formed some things into your life that are there that are good to you and good for you. But this thing called the world that's riddled with sin because of our actions, it, it, it's no good to us. And so this is why Jesus tells us to seek his righteousness, seek the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. And that righteousness is up front and center in Jesus Christ, the word of God, right? And as we believe in it, as we believe in him, not only are we saved eternally, but we walk in him. And so that's the second component. That's that's a choice. And that's a cho Well, it's a choice to come to God um, by with and through Jesus Christ for eternal salvation. But it can end there. But if you willingly choose to sanctify, right? Progressive sanctification, your present day salvation, that's spiritual maturation. It's a choice. Because you're either going to God or you're going away from God. There, there is no in between, according to Revelation 3, right? You're either hot or you're cold for him, but you can't be lukewarm. And so that's what we're talking about here. So he's invested this, this thing called discipleship, a.k.a. sanctification, a.k.a. spiritual maturation. And that's where we're at right here is trying to do that U-turn. All right. We've 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 trusted Jesus Christ for eternal salvation, a.k.a. we, we believed in him um, for that. And we're eternally secure. But that that practice in Jesus Christ is what we're focusing here. Hence, our walk. We want to walk with him. We want to talk with him. We want to get a step closer to him. We don't want to have that premature death. We want to have that 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 faith um, that, that James talks about. He says faith without works is dead. And he's not saying that, that that the works are what get you saved. No, what he's saying is, is that inward manifestation that comes right? The indwelling spirit should attest and attest according to what Paul says uh, in Romans 8, that we're adopted sons and daughters of the most high God. But, but where is our faith in the right object, aka Jesus Christ, our faith in the right object, 
and saves us eternally, justifies us before God, our outward manifestation of that indwelling spirit allows us to be justified amongst humanity, right? Because when we receive Christ, when we believe in him, something has to change, all right? And so we go in this, at least in this ministry, and according to the Bible, that sanctification, that spiritual maturity comes through learning our God and believing in our God. But we can't believe, well, remember old Dr. Hickson that we talked about, he gives some, some, some good nuggets there. He says, so many of us want to try to go, this is my words, A to Z, but what he says is so many of us want to try to believe in God and all of this stuff first, but really there's, there's, there's a there's a step process that goes along with that. And so you start backward planning that with the end in mind being believing. All right. You have to trust, but you can't trust until you're there. All right. And so we, we, we know, trust and believe and that know and trust are essential. And it says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, according to Romans 10 and 17. All right. With, uh, you know, in Hebrews 11 and one says now faith, this is substance hopeful with the evidence of things not seen. So um, so so we have to get to know our God and build those faith reps. We have to we have to understand who he is and what he does for us. And as we do this right, we begin to trust him. And as we begin to trust him along the way by knowing him, uh, being in relationship with him. Uh, we build those faith reps, and those faith reps allow us to believe through the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so that's the investment that we have. So that's the present day salvation. If we so should choose to be a student, that's all a disciple is, is a student, a learner of this thing. All right. We make this our profession, we make this our life. And I talk a lot about not being a nine to five Christian where we clock in and clock out and say, hey, I mean, I made it to church. I, I made it to Bible study. But no, we, we live that. That's why we we want to edify the body with things uh, throughout the week in terms of some biblical trivia, some biblical history, some some knowledge where this thing is good to you, practical application. So that when the hard times come, as Jesus talked about, you built it upon the rock, the rock of our salvation is Jesus Christ. That is our confession. And confession just means to say or state something again that you have already heard. And so that's why in Romans 10, where it says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you confess in your mouth, uh, the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And when he's talking about there, he being Paul, he, he goes back to the beginning parts of that. He says, I wish above all things Right. He, he wished that Israel would be saved. And so then he alludes back to Deuteronomy, um, Deuteronomy 30. He, he, he talks about how the word is near to them. The word is near. And, and they simply just have to believe again and what they have already heard. In other words, to confess in that thing in which they have already believed. And so. So that's the point of it. They, they, they already have heard it. They've already believed in it. Now they just have to go back and recall that thing and, and, and to call upon it. And then that's where it goes on to say is that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, right? Because they've already believed it. They just now have to go forth and to walk into it. And so that leads us to that third portion of it. Um, that's the future, um, future salvation, which is our glorification. And, and again, none of these things come by our own hands right none of these things our justification is our faith uh in jesus christ christ crucified what god did to jesus on the cross for us right um and then the present day salvation our sanctification is us willingly coming to god looking towards jesus as the example and allowing him to guide us through his holy spirit and with his word right and then the future salvation which is our glorification right we don't glory in ourselves we glory in the lord now glorification is getting rid of this body so you hear me talk a lot about um this body that is corrupted by sin is defiled and it's gonna have an expected end right it, it, it has an expiration date so whether we choose to to come back to God or not, this thing called our body is gonna gonna go away. And the book of Hebrews tells us everyone is appointed once to die and to be judged. If you are secure in Christ, right, because you have believed in Him for eternal salvation, you go before the bema seat. You're judged um, based upon your works. But you say, Pastor, you said we're not saved by our works. You are correct. You still have a seat in heaven. But your eternal rewards and your eternal promotion and positions uh, are all 
placed upon judgment there, okay? Um, so there's still much to go for in this thing called the modern day life, right? Whereas if you choose to rebuff, to rebuke, or reject, however you want to call it, Jesus Christ for eternal salvation, you go before the right throne of judgment, and you have eternal separation from God. Um, and that eternal separation leads to torment. It leads to just, I mean, just separation from God alone. To be unplugged from God for eternity, that should be enough to tell you that's not a good place. So God has invested a lot in, into you, into me, to we. No matter how bad things seem to get, um, he's invested and he still has a strategy for you. So I talked about the past where Christ went to the cross for us. That's good. He, he's still serving uh, his, his heavenly father uh, as our high priest, as our advocate. He even intercedes. Um, the Holy Spirit is our, is our true intercessor, but, but Jesus Christ advocates and intercedes for us as well. So that's the active. And in the future, guess what? Spoiler, he's coming again. So he's never stopped loving us. And so if you if you think about all that, God has invested a lot into us, um, probably more than we can even fathom about us investing into ourselves. And so that's the, the precipice that we're looking. We're, 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 we're pumped up here over these last couple of weeks, looking at this road to redemption. And so as the slide turns there, we're finding our way back to God. And that's what this is all about. Um, and it's twofold, as I talked about last week. It's just, it's, it's really for us to understand how much God loves us, active voice, active, not passive, not future, not that he will love us. But yes, he loved us. He loves us, active, and he will continue to love us. But that is that, that he loves us. So, so he drew us in. So think about Jeremiah 31. Um, the prophet Jeremiah talking to Israel says, uh, the Lord has appeared to me of old um, and has said, you know, with loving God, I have loved you with the everlasting love. With loving kindness, I have drawn you, right? But the, the beginning part of that, it talks about the children who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. Right? And then he talks about the, the, the loving kindness in which he's drawn his chosen people. And well, guess what? All right, that, that, that might be, really the target audience might be Israel, but it's very applicable to us because Israel serves as that microcosm. And, and, and just as Israel fell, right, that serves as a sounding board of all the creation because Israel was supposed to be the light and the beacon onto the world and show what the right relationship with God was, right? But I submit to you, they still will because he will show that loving kindness. He will show that grace and mercy when he wraps his arms all right, uh, once not a people, right, or once are no longer my people, that little army, not my people, to army, all right, we were not his creation, and we were not anywhere in his eyes and his presence, because sin is abomination uh, to him, but oh, the shed blood of Jesus allows us to be brought back in the right standings, that's how much he loves us, so, so finding our way back, so the first and foremost, there is to understand as a Christian the importance of our salvation, right? And as good as that thing is to us, it's not about, hey, I got mine. That, that, that's not what this thing about is about. It's about, hey, yes, God has done some great things for me. Now, let me pay this thing forward by edifying the body of Christ, because as one prospers, we all prosper. As one suffers, we all suffer. But it's also going in and in in and allowing the spirit to do some spiritual pruning, a la John 15, right? Um, those things that might be growing in accordance with God, so well, he's gonna still prune to make that thing grow even better and stronger. But he's gonna cut cut off the things that are not his and provide providing that spiritual righteousness, that spiritual growth. Okay. And then he goes down in John 15 and 7, he tells us, he says. Um, you know, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you shall ask and it shall be given to you. Whatever it is that you ask, it shall be given to you by this. Who is glorified? My father is glorified. Did you what? Bear much fruit and be my disciples. Right. And so he's talking about that, 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 that progressive sanctification, that, that spiritual maturation there, um, that you walk in this thing, you walk in his righteousness and that you bear his fruit. And so in Galatians 5, Paul tells us, you know, the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, joy, right? Self-control. 
and he, he tells us these things. Um, these are the evidence of, of the fruit of the spirit within you. And so every regenerated man or woman, uh, every born again Christian, however you want to call it, uh, saved Christian has the indwelling spirit according to Romans 8. And so, so we can be like nine out of those 10 lepers and receive this deliverance. Remember, uh, the, the word for deliverance is, is the Greek word is soteria or, or to save or deliver is sozo or soso, the more colloquial version of it, modern day uh, Greek. But, but it means deliverance, be it both eternal and temporal. So, so think about this for a second. You can be like those 10 lepers and receive your deliverance there from a, just a horrible affliction and go off, right? Um, and there are Christians out in the world um, that, that, that do that. Or you can be like the one that has come back and wants to, to, to have a more intimate relationship with your Lord Jesus Christ, right? The Lordship part is not, is not instrumental in you being saved because what he gives he gives freely understand that hence the free grace he freely gives his grace all you have to do is receive it and once you receive it you are saved eternally now the desire is that you accept jesus as your lord as your savior and hence um what, what paul is explaining he says to confess to 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 say again to believe again what you've already heard all right. And so that's why this walk is important for the regenerated man and woman in Christ, um, because it's it's good to reflect on that walk, that every day you should be getting a step closer to your God and a step further away from the things of this world. Right. You should be getting a, a step closer by knowing him, by trusting him and ultimately believing him. that the steps that are righteous are ordered by God. But we but we, we've we learned in Romans three that there is none righteous among us, not one. Right. Romans 3 and, and 10 says that. And then all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3 and 23. And we keep repeating these scriptures each and every week, just like Romans 6 and 23. Um, the, all, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is everlasting life. Your outputs in the natural is sin, and it leads to death. God's output is everlasting life. It's not anything that you have earned. It's not anything that you deserve. It's not anything that you can afford. And if the Christian does not understand that, then you cannot fully appreciate what God has invested into you. And so as we learn about the greatest love story ever, a.k.a. the Bible, right? Um, and no offense to any romance novels or any plays or movies, the tear jerkers and stuff like that. From cover to cover, it's all about being created out of his love, breaking his heart. But yet in his love and his kindness, he has drawn us back in and he continues to draw us back in. He has not given up on us yet. And so you, me, we have to be the pale bearers. We have to be the sounding board in a dark and depraved world because they're not going to get that off television. They're not going to get that off the Internet. They're not going to get that in the newspaper. They're not going to get that in the magazine. But they're going to see you who says that you are a Christian Right. And that that witness that I told you, you should bear witness to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this only occurs by you understanding the totality of of making your way back to God. All right. And so that's the duality there is, 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 is the testimony. It's not about you. It's about the, the Jesus in you and what he has done for you, done to you and is now doing through you. And that's the light that needs to go for. So I'd be remiss. If we don't take time out each and every time we have the opportunity to talk about that, okay? And that should be your stance going forth. You, you, you give God the glory and honor and thanks for who he is and not just what he can do for you. Um, because those things that he can do for you, right, um, they can take some time. Or they might not be aligned with his will in this season. You can get frustrated. But if you just glorify him for who he is, um, then you always be put on, on, on a solid foundation. Okay, so, so as we transition here, we were talking uh, over the last uh, two weeks about this man named Abram. This man named Abram being called out. And we talked about there's, there's three stages in play here in Genesis 12. We talked about a transition, we talked about transit, and we talked about transformation. And last week, in these slides, I didn't really change too much because, like tonight, I kind of ran my mouth. And we didn't get to the crux of what we were supposed to. Um, so the consideration, we're going to leave that the same. The return on investment, right, um, is the cost of the sacrifice 
versus the cost of obedience, right? Is it really worth it? God doesn't necessarily reward the sacrifice. He acknowledges it, but he, he, he wants your heart. This is what I was talking about on Sunday. And if you missed it, go back to the sermon. He, he, he wants the heart. He doesn't look to the exterior. He wants to look to the interior and see the motives of the heart, right? Because he knows we're going to mess up, but, but do you have a heart longing for him? So he understands the sacrifice. He understood the sacrifice of what he was asking Jesus, but he rewarded the obedience, right? He re rewarded the obedience. And if the cross is going to be our compass, if that's what we're going to emulate, we have to understand he already knows the cost of the sacrifice, but he wants you to be rewarded for the obedience. We have to stop running for the cost of sacrifice and move towards the reward of obedience, okay? And so the, the ways of mankind, they, they seem pure, they seem right according to Proverbs 16 and 2, but the motives, aka that heart, are weighed by God. And so you need to reflect upon that cost of the sacrifice versus the reward of your obedience. And this is very important when you start overlaying this thing um, called um, the transition for Abram, right? And so um, the, the, the trivia question I threw out last week was, where did God command Abram to go to? And so the answer was Canaan. All right. And so the reason why I threw that out there is because I had another question there. And, and, and you know, the, who were the Canaanites descendants of? And so we, we got a little mixed bag of answers there. Um, but again, sometimes an apple just really is an apple. <laughs> really not that deep. Right. Um, so the Canaanites were descendants of Canaan. Right. The grandson of Noah. And if you know anything about uh, Canaan, he was cursed by Noah. Um, and the reason why I threw this in here is because not only does Abram get called out of the land of Ur to go to the Canaan, but there are some promises made by God. And there are promises made uh, to Abram, and there was promises uh, to honor the curse given by Noah on to Canaan. All right. And these two will come to a, 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 a front a head front um, um, here in the book of Genesis. They will come to, to um, come into play as we go through the rest of the Pentateuch, Exodus, uh, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, but they will also come into play, right, um, in the end times, eschatologically, right? Um, and why is that? Well, the land that, that is promised to Abram and his descendants, okay, is the land that has been that has been cursed um, by God through Noah on to Canaan and his descendants, the Canaanites, all right? And so what you have to understand, and there's a lot of uh, a study that I, I really want you to understand, is that, that the Canaan was cursed, okay? Um, in the book of Deuteronomy, talks about blessings, I will bless you, curses, I will curse you. And so the, the, the descendants of Abraham um, in Deuteronomy 28 are, are, are told, this is after a whole generation minus two are, 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 uh, have perished because of their disobedience, right? Wandering in the, in the wilderness, aka the desert. Um, but Deuteronomy 28, he, he tells them that, hey, the, if, if you follow my commands, you'll be blessed. I'm paraphrasing. If you don't follow, you'll be cursed. And guess what? Spoiler, uh, the Israelites did not follow. And so they were cursed. And hence, the 10 northern tribes that, that were the northern kingdom, a.k.a. Israel, uh, scattered to the four corners of the wind. And then Judah um, and, and, and Dan, to be, to be combined there. Um, they were taken captive. They were taken away, brought back, and you know, and the rest is, is somewhat history. But there will come a time in which God will call back, and it'll be during the, the tribulation, um, tremendous suffering. Uh, Israel will be judged, and creation will be judged. And hence, what you see in the book of Daniel, you see in the book of Isaiah, you see in the book of Ezekiel, and you see in the book of Jeremiah. And then, really, our Lord Jesus Christ talks uh, about these end times on uh, the, the Olivet Discord and so a uh, discourse. And so when you when you put all these things together, you start seeing God's word, right? And so when you look at God's word on purpose, because he's an intentional God, 
and you believe he is who he says he is because you've you've gotten in this word, you've studied its word, um, and, and you've, you've, you've come to know his word, and you've become to trust the word, you believe in his word. So if God's word tells us in Isaiah 55 that it shall not go out void, and the context of that is, is he's, he's speaking through the prophet Isaiah to the Israelites that, hey, you know, they're licking their wounds, and they're they're upset and they believe that God has forgotten about them, but he's telling them he's not forgotten about them, that his word shall not go out void. And this is a message to the modern day church. He has not gone out void. Uh, his word says what it means, it does what it says and, and, and says what it means, right? Uh, it shall not fail. So if you understand that and, and the curse comes upon Canaan and his descendants, the Canaanites, all right? And God then in turn tells Abram uh, to get to Canaan, all right? This is a land that he did not know. He, said, he tells him to get out of your country, all right? A land of familiarity, a land of foreign gods and, and cultures and this and that. Things that, that seemed all right to Abram. Now he's telling him to leave, to go, to get up out of it, um, to move. And these are the things I will bless you with. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. Now, the context behind that is, remember, Abram means exalted father, but he couldn't have a child. He's older and his wife is barren. Okay, so put that and put that there. But God's word shall not go out void. So in this, this, this area, you have Canaan, right? And he's cursed and his descendants are now cursed, but they possess this land. So now you have potential confrontation. So it comes down to, do you believe God? Do you believe he is who he says he is? And do you believe he'll do what he says he'll do? And so the reason why I love to show this is because Abram has to go through this walk. He has to go through the, the, the knowledge stage. He, he gets to know God and he begins to trust God, right? But, but in between all that, he stumbles and he bumbles here, right? He stumbles and bubbles and gets to the land of Haran. And we'll show that here in a second. But he tells him, he says, I will bless you and make you a great and make your name great. Well, your name is everything in this culture. And so you can only imagine the laughter and, 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 and the ribbing that comes along with the fact that he can't have a kid. Right. He can't have a child. And, and so so now he's saying your name will be great and you shall be a blessing. OK, you, sh you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. Okay, again, God's word is going out, so it's really about what you believe. And so Abram had to make a choice here. Do I believe in him and walk in him? Well, I, I, I get to know him, and so he goes and he walks out, and it, it's not always a smooth patch. It's a little rough, but but he, he goes out, all right? But, but you'll see that he doesn't always follow instructions. He doesn't always follow directions. But what you will see through God's dealings with Abram is his love and kindness, right? And so when you start looking at what the prophets say in the, in, in the Emmanuel prophecy uh, in, in, in the book of Isaiah, and you, you start seeing um, uh, the, the fact that he talks about taking the, the sins upon himself in the book of Isaiah, and you, and you see where uh, J Jeremiah, he talks about the, the everlasting love and with love and kindness he has drawn you. Uh, drawn him in. And in Jeremiah 20, 29, he talks about uh, that, that, that he has uh, he has thoughts towards him, or more commonly, the plans. I, I know the plans I have for you. All these things come into play when you see Father Abraham here and the promise that he places upon the patriarch there, right? It cannot be done by natural means. All right, and we'll, we'll build the case for that over some weeks here. Um, but Abram and Sarai, right, she, they, they, they can't conceive. And really, their offspring, Isaac and Rebekah, they can't conceive. And so this would be foreshadowing of what could not be done in the natural, right, our salvation. It all leads back to that, right, the plan, the road to redemption. That's what we're talking about, that path to salvation. Um, the seed of Abraham that would be the seed that is our Lord Jesus Christ, right? And he says, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. Remember, his word shall not go out void. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Hmm. Now this is coming again in the natural. <laughs> the natural, he's called exalted father, but 
spiritually by God, he is called father of many nations. So what do you call? What's in the name? What do you call? What is the world calling you? And what is God calling you to? Right. All right. So so it says, I will and I will curse him who curses you and you and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Here it is. Verse four it says, so Abraham departed. Oh, he, he moved out. He moved out smartly. And Abraham uh, and Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him. All right. He had him at his word. Uh, Ab he had Abram at his word. All right. Uh, and, and so he goes out. Um and, and, and Lot went with him, uh -oh. and Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Herod, all right, then Abram and Sarai, uh, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all the possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Herod, they departed to go to the land of Canaan, okay, so quick refresher, the Canaanites, the Canaanites were a group of ancient people who live in the land of Canaan, on the eastern shores of the Mediterranean Sea. Hmm. Canaan is described in the Bible as extending from Lebanon, all right, so that's to the north of, of, of Israel, to the northeast of Israel there, modern-day Israel, and uh, uh, toward, toward the brook of Egypt in the south. So that's to the southwest border there of, of, of modern-day Israel, right? And, and the Jordan River Valley in the east, and so extends to the east of modern-day Jordan, right? In the Bible, notably in Genesis 10, and then you go again to Numbers 34, I told you you'd see these guys again, this was called the land of Canaan, right? And occupies the same area that is occupied by modern Lebanon, all right, I told you up into the northeast up there, um, and Israel, plus parts of Jordan in Syria, and yet in Syria, borders to the, to the east, northeast there, uh, adjacent to Lebanon, and in there with, with, with Israel, nestled there is, is Israel on the coast, right? And so the Canaanites are mentioned over 150 times in the Bible. They were a wicked, idolatrous people, descendant of Noah's grandson, Canaan, um, uh, and, and was a son um, was a son of Ham. And you, you see the incident in Genesis 9 and 18 where he sees, um, and then going into 20 and 25 there, and Canaan was cursed because of his and his father's sin against Noah. And they went to see him naked and then they tried to cover him up instead of trying to trying to help him there. Right. And so, you know, I asked you last week, what are you called from and called to and how is it changing you? OK, so there's a transition there and that transition. Um, and we're going to go real quickly into Genesis 11, because uh, I, I, I believe you got to understand the context behind some things. And so what you see on the screen there, this is the genealogy. Terah is the, is the father of Abram, okay? Um, and Genesis 11 is most notably known for um, the Tower of Babel. And so when you go from Genesis chapter 6, where you see God looking down and is disgusted with the world and commissions Noah to go build the ark, right? In Genesis 7, he goes in earnest and judgment comes down. And so 8... Uh, describes the, the reckoning. And then nine, as, as they have come out, he, he you know, bestows upon them a covenant um, and, and the world is, is forever changed. And so when you get into 10, though, um, Noah was out there doing what he does in terms of the, uh, in terms of the land and, and, and so forth. He was working, comes back and gets drunk and, and um, his son, his grandson, see him naked, um, and they do some deplorable things and they're cursed, right? God's word, God's word. And so their offsprings go forth and hence the Tower of Babel and, and humanity is spread across. Languages are confused, okay? And so at the end of Genesis midway and then at the end of Genesis 11, here we find um, some genealogy and then it gets down to Terah. Um, and then Terah, again, is uh, Abram's father. Now, genealogies are important, not only in this culture, right, in the Near East, uh, as well as the, 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 the Middle East. Um, um, it's, it's, it's very in, important um, in terms of bloodlines. And so when you start looking at the Synoptic Gospels, you start seeing some of that bloodline uh, to show the authenticity of Jesus's, uh, Jesus's, claim not only to the throne, 
Um, it shows also his, his claim as the premier um, priest and the, the priestly line, as well as um, the son of man, the son of God, right? And so, so th those threefold there. So they use the genealogy there. In, in one of the gospels, we show um, Mary's lineage, right? And then we show the Davidic lineage coming through um, through Joseph, right? Which gives him the sovereign right to um, to be quote unquote the king, right? The earthly king. And so between those two things, all the proof should have been in a the pudding there. So genealogy is is it might not be everything, but it's a lot of stuff within within the culture, and that's why you'll see it throughout um, various parts within the Bible here. So as we talk about Terah, it talks about Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Right, Haran uh, begot Lot. Right, that's the nephew. That's that, that that's that's Abram's uh, nephew. Right, and Haran uh, died before his father uh, Terah in his native land in Ur of the Chaldeans. Right, um, then Abram and Aher took wives. The name of Abram's wife was what Sarai, um, uh, and the name of Nahor's wife Micah, um, uh, Milka, and the daughter Haran, the father of Milka, and the father of Iska. Right. But Sarai was barren. So here we go. It's, it, this is where we get that she's barren. She had no child. And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, um, and his daughter Sarai, his, his son Abram, Abram's wife, and they went out from, uh, went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. Right. They were supposed to go to Canaan. So along the way, right? And they came to Haran and dwelt there. Anyone been there? And so they got distracted. They got to some familiarity. They got some to comfort level and they stayed there. So the days of Terah were 205 years and Terah died in Haran. Okay, so we go back up. We go back up. So Abram was supposed to go on to, to the land of Cain, right? And so here we are back in Genesis 12. And Genesis 12 tells us, um, that God commands Abram, get out of your country from your family, right? And Haran is, is up towards, closer towards uh, the eastern parts of Syria, what's modern day Syria, right? On the border there will be Iraq, Syria, going in to the land uh, of Canaan, right? Um, so it says, now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house. Okay, so there's a transition going on here. One, first and foremost, getting out of the country, getting out of the land of the Chaldeans, right? Um, so that was that was edict number one. Get away from that, right? Uh, and, and getting away, aka from the culture, getting away from their um, their their religion and all our customs and so forth. Because why? God, just like with us today, He's commanding us to separate, and just like He commanded Abram, separate himself from those things of that world. And this is on the cusp of, um, of depravity really running rampant once again, right? So he's calling them out. He's calling them out of the of, of what he knew to be the world, he being Abram, uh, and back onto him. And so you hear me talk a lot of times about twofold deliverance. Deliverance from emotional, uh, mental, spiritual, and physical bondage, right? That's the first one. That's freely given. Boom. And then the one that we have to make a choice, and that's our deliverance back onto him. Okay. And so that's why I talk so much about the justification, the sanctification, and the glorification, because this is a recurring theme. Because salvation, regardless of dispensation, has always been the same. Belief in God's word, right? Be it the word incarnate in the flesh, or be it his word here uh, sprinkled throughout, um, throughout the Bible there. Okay. So he told them, he told them to transition to get out of your country, right? Uh, and he told him also, what, from your family. Now, did he do that? Anyone? Did he do that? Did, did, did Abram transition from, from the family? How many, how many folk been there, right? Told to get out of that familiar place and to be with him, to be with his God um, and to leave the family behind. But we just talked about that. Who did he take along with him? He took, uh, he, he, he took Lot with him and that, that will have its way going along. Right. And from your father's house. But yet, you know, we still had 
things affixed um, to him, but love and kindness, God is still guiding him along. And he says, to a land that I will show you, right? Uh, he, he, he's saying this, this, this place. And so as he's removing, as this transition is going on, all right, he, he, he's saying that I will be that provider and I will bless you and I'll make your name great. It's, you see that God takes accountability for his people, right? And just and the lessons that we learn from this is, as I get excited and I start jumping ahead here, the lessons that you learn is just that and so many times, you'll see how this ties back to what I'm talking about, that return on investment. So many times we focus on this thing called the sacrifice, right? And so many times we focus on that, that we, we don't look towards the reward of obedience. So here's the deal. He's telling him to, to, to get out of his country, all right? That the familiarity of the situation, the things that are comfortable, right? Anyone had some familiar situations and comfortable situations and wondering why God is telling us to transition, right? Why do we have the transition here? Well, he's drawing you back to him, just like he's drawing Abram. Now, this, you got the whole world, right? And he's got the whole world in his hands, but he chose Abram, right? To go through the one to, to that he would bring through this lineage, um, that road to redemption. He would lay that path so that the, the, the path of salvation would come through the sea, right? So, so he's, he's, he's paying it forward on credit by faith, right? He's, he's giving him his word. He's telling him, hey, you leave this stuff behind. And if you do this, I will bless you. Oh, that, that sounds like some things that we go through on a habitual basis, uh, so, some rewards. He's telling the transition and, and, and he's telling him, I will bless you and I'll make your name great. Now, you know, he, he seemed to be doing pretty well. He had possessions. He seemed to be doing pretty well. In this thing called life, where he was at, but God is telling him to, to, to move and to take this out on faith. He really told him to leave that family behind and just go, right, to go. Um, and so when I ask you to consider the return on investment um, of the things that you've left behind and to consider about this cost of sacrifice as opposed to the reward of obedience. Now, understand this. This, this is an investment, so you're not going to get... If you know anything about investment, you put into stocks, that, that market might go up and down and, and bonds or T-bills and stuff like that. You don't just get the return on investment immediately. You have to wait patiently for it, right? And there are things that God promised and, and things that came to fruition and things that are yet to come to fruition that Abram, aka Abraham, never got to see, right? But he went anyways. How about us? That, that cost of the sacrifice. He's leaving some things behind, right? Uh, just the familiarity alone is, is enough to drive somebody, you know, kind of to, to anxious moments. So, so he listened to the word of God and he moved out according to the word of God. The, the, the word of God is still blessing. He says, I will bless you and make your name great and, and you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and, 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 and I will curse him who curses you. Now, again, if you haven't had the opportunity, and I know I talk a whole lot about the book of Romans and say that's my favorite book. I talk a whole lot about the book of John and say that's probably my favorite book. I talk a whole lot about the book of Isaiah and probably say that's my favorite book. And then, I, of course, I talk a lot about Genesis probably more than any other book and say that's my favorite book. I, I get excited. but So depending upon the, the day of the week, depends upon, you know, and, so there's four or four there and seven days of the week. I might talk about one more than another. But the bottom line is if you read the book of Isaiah, okay, you read the book of Isaiah and it's really split in halves. It's, it's talking about the, 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 the symptoms of why uh, Israel is low on me, not my people. Why, why God has removed his hand from them. He's divorced them. Why their separation, okay? But then he, he goes on to tell them the plan that is in store for them, okay? And he gives them hope. And this is all on the heels. And really, it's Isaiah is it's really prophesizing to Judah, okay? Um, but but in this, because uh, Isaiah was assigned to Judah, Ezra to Ezra to, to Israel, to Northern Kingdom. But in this, it, the message goes out not just to Judah, but to Judah and to Israel, to the totality, the, the whole of the 12 tribes. And what he's telling them is, is, is that, hey, you just got to hold on because my word, hence, my word shall not go out void, 
right? And he, he, he also talks about my, my, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, so far as the heavens are from the earth, and so are my thoughts and ways. And he says, you know, hey, my words shall not go out void. In other words, right, he, he has a plan uh, that includes them. They simply need to believe, but they can't believe unless they trust, and they can't trust unless they know him. And what had happened was they had grown far from him and began to trust in things other than their God. Okay. And so when he talks about making your name great and you shall be a blessing, right? It, a lot of that is prophesied in the book of Isaiah there. And then if you want to pivot as well um, into our captivity and talking about the book of Jeremiah, as well as in, the, in his Ezekiel, but in particular, in Jeremiah 29, he talks about, he says, uh, you know, seek the peace of the place I've taken captive in. And, and the NIV version says, seek the peace and prosperity of the place I have taken you to, for in doing so, you shall have peace and prosperity, right? And then you go down some, some lines, and that's where in Jeremiah 29 talks about, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, but for me to give you hope in the future, right? Or the, the New King James Version says, I know the thoughts I think towards you. In other words, he's just addressing to Israel their complaints that you have forgotten about us. You told us we will prosper. You told us these things, yada, 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 yada. But he's telling them that the condition is, is that your mind has been placed on your own actions and on your own works, right? But I need you to do that U-turn. I need you to come back to me. And that's what we learn about Israel. It's just that, that, that God's promises keep. They have not gone away, but the hearts of the people have turned, right? And so, so what we learn as the, as the church is, is that, that Christ is coming back uh, for us. God's promises keep. The word of God will come back. It shall not go out void. And so we have to understand this, that, that something delayed doesn't mean denied, but we need to check our hearts. Abram didn't get it all right, but again, God judged the heart, just like we talked about, about David, and, and people were looking for this one and that one, and, and they might have looked apart, and, but they didn't necessarily act apart, and so God's word is in those who are the servants of him, right? The yielded servant, that's how I closed out on Sunday, right? It's the yielded servant. And so here you have a yielded servant. It starts in the beginning here with Abram. He didn't get it all right. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that. And, and, and I can talk just as much from my faults as I can probably more so than my successes, right? I, I can talk more about those faults um, than I can about my successes. And so when we look at this, we can, we can overlay those faults by his heart. But the heart. And so what you'll see is, is, is that maturation. So you start seeing that transition to the transit. So he tells him to move out and he says, I'll bless you and make your name great. Oh, that's pretty powerful. And you shall be a blessing. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll be a blessing. All right. Not by my, my own hands, but you're saying this, Lord. I'll bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, the blessings I will bless you and, and, and I will curse him who curse you. And this will become important as we begin to transition to the latter stages of Genesis 12 here and going on to 13 and 14 there. Because you'll see again, my thoughts are not your thoughts, your ways, your ways, uh, way, my ways, your, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways, my ways, right? And so in his mind, there was a plan. And spoiler alert, it's, it's, it's not cheating to, to go ahead, but there's a famine. And in his rush, they leave the land that God had promised him to prosper in. And so there's some shenanigans that go along with that. And that would be, again, some of the stumblings and bumblings that would lead to his maturation, but would also cause some turmoil there, right? Have we, have we been there? Can we relate to that? Um, but this is why we have to get to know our God. And, and Abram became intricately familiar with his God. He began to trust his God. And at the crucible moment there, he believed in his God. So that's us there. So, so, so as there was a transition, there was a transit there. There was a transition out of the land of Ur, the familiarity there. He began to transit there. Okay, and I will bless you. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. So, if you have God at His word, then when the tough times come, okay, 
We stand upon that word. And that's what Jesus is telling us, that building it upon that rock, it, the, the assurance that, that he who did not uh, spare his own son, how much will he not, uh, but gave him up for us all, how much will he not um, give us all things? That's according to Romans 8. And, but, but here, and we'll leave on this, it says, so Abram departed as the Lord, what? He said, Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, right? That, that, that faith in God's word. And Lot went with him, was supposed to go. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Verse 5, then Abram took Sarai, uh, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and, their, and all their possessions that they had gathered, right? They had taken the stuff that they had, um, down in Ur, and they had collected more stuff in Haran, and this will become a theme. They collect stuff um, along the way. Um, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran. Now they got they got folks. They got a network going on here. None of these things were supposed to go with them, right? And they departed to go to the land of Canaan. All right. All right. So, so there was a transition there. All right. Um, and there's a trust factor that goes along with this transition. Some of us are in the midst of a transition right now, be it physical, mental. I, I, was, I, I would submit to you that most of us are in a mental transition there. That mental transition really is impacting our hearts, um, uh, our bodies, and our souls. And that mental transition is, is trusting God above all things. Um, and that's part of our spiritual maturity. Uh, Abram had to go through this, right? His descendants would go through this. In particular, Jacob would go through this, um, uh, trusting not in our own uh, understanding, right? What does Proverbs 3 tell us? Uh, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Again, God wants the heart. And lean not on our own understanding. Lean not on your own understanding. But acknowledge, you know, acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will direct your paths. He will what? And, and direct your past, but you first got to acknowledge him, okay? You got to acknowledge him in all your ways, and he'll direct the past. And so that's that's such a key factor there. And so when you start looking at the Bible in a more meaningful and connected way, because God is intentional, and he put this thing together so that you could live this thing called life on purpose, you start seeing how this thing connected. So did he not promise this? And what I try to show you is how it reverberates throughout time and how it is yet to come, the fullness of the promise there. But yet it's still blessing, okay? And so he moved out on faith, right? He's, he's, he's getting to know his God. And in the midst of that, he's somewhat trusting, but he, he's, he's, he's suffering here, all right? That transition of the mind of, of doing it and understanding it yourself instead of leaning on God. So what about us here? That return on investment. Are, are we focusing on that cost of sacrifice or are we leaning towards the reward of obedience? Because his love never fails, right? His love will never fail. All right. Um, so hopefully, hopefully we got something out of that tonight. We'll, we'll go down through the rest of those, uh, those verses and we'll talk about that transformation, right? Uh, that 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 um, we'll, we'll go go back from uh, the 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 transit portion of it to the transformation. There, I'm sorry, I'm a little tongue twisted here. Uh, we'll we'll go from the transition, right? And I, I'm stuck on the transition of our mind to the transit to the transformation. And so, my challenge to you today would be: um, what is it to what what is it that God has placed upon you uh, and placed upon your mind that you're having a hard time transiting from uh, and that as you transit uh, it, 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 this transition this transition will allow you um, to transition from our thoughts of the sacrifice to the reward of the obedience because while it might be delayed anything that God is giving is far superior to anything that we can receive in this world, all right? And that's part of the transformation. All right, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we call to you tonight, and we thank you for having you at your word. And Father God, your word is pure, and it delights our hearts. And so, Father God, let us hide it deep within our heart. 
and let it be nourishing to our souls and let it order our steps. So, Father God, as we go forth, we go forth by faith, Father God, until your very word manifests, knowing that you are who you say you are, that you'll do what you say you will do, and you'll do it for us. So we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. And we thank you for the one, Father God, that is equipped, empowered, and encouraged by, with, and through your word, and the one that has turned from his wicked ways, the one that has turned from her wicked ways, and turned back to you by believing in Jesus Christ for eternal salvation. We rejoice, Father God, for the believer and for the unbeliever that has turned in Jesus his holy and mighty name. Thank you. Amen. All right, two quick announcements. Uh, remember those who are within the local area, uh, we've, we've got author Talicia, aka Pastor Talicia, here on Saturday from 10 to 12, uh, and she's got the, the Monday motivational book that she is launching. It's a, it's, a, it's a great book that if you haven't seen the advertisements and the promos uh, up on the Facebook website, check it out. Um, supporting those within the body of Christ, but but just as importantly, if you want to get some educational tips, she's she's all, she. I mean, she, the Lord has blessed her in a mighty way. She is a she is a contender here for uh, the the teacher of the year, um, not just the district area, but going out. All right, so up and out. So God is doing some great things. So she doesn't just you know throw that out there, but she is she is credentialed behind it and backed. Um, but no more so important than the Lord. So if you're in the local area, 10 to 12, come out and check that out. And if you don't want to get the book, you don't know, give two hoots about that. Um, in tandem, we have our back to school giveaway, hence the, the, the book for the educators. So we want the educators along with educated. So we're putting those things together. So, so the school supplies are completely free. Uh, the only thing that we ask is if they, you receive it and you don't want it, just gift it to somebody else. All right. So come down and see us um, at a very minimum. We, we, we just, you know, we ask that you plant a seed of prayer uh, that as we give out these, these school supplies, that I might bless the folks that use them. Right. Uh, might bless them to, to get them to the place that they want to be for their education. That's all we're asking. Uh, that's, the, that's the only donation that we want. Is, 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 is to plant that seed uh, of prayer by, with, and through our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Um, and then we also have this Sunday, uh, same regular time at 11 o'clock Eastern time here at 951 South McPherson uh, Church Road, um, uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina, 2303, uh, at 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock a.m., we have the Young in Christ service. So Pastor Talisa will be coming. You get a double feature. Uh, she's going to come forth with the anointed word, with, with all of what God is planning into her. So this is going to be a great weekend because the Lord is giving back uh, to his people uh, through this ministry. So we thank you now uh, for your support. Come out, get some school supplies. Come out and support your, your local, uh, local author. Um, and if you would like, uh, I, I believe she's given the links over the net, over the, 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 the Facebook site. Check us out there. She's also got her own Facebook site there, which you can check that out. Um, and we just want to support God's people uh, as he continues to move his gifts through them. All right. So that's the promo there. But again, if you don't want to drop any amount of monetary stuff, we take prayers because prayer changes some things. And so we pray for the body of Christ and for healing and deliverance and winning this battlefield that's that's the mind. So we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. Go in peace, be blessed, and give some Jesus.